So we have a listener that has a question, and this is um, something that I think a lot of us struggle with, where you've got one person that's really good at organizing, and then you have somebody in the relationship like you and me who's creative and that has clutter. Yeah. And so let's play this question, because I'd love to hear your advice on how you deal with that kind of relationship conflict. Hi, Mel. It's Therese. What do you do if your spouse is a sloppy person, but you're not? I feel like I am constantly trying to organize our house and keep it clean, but my husband has such a difficult time keeping it that way. I am constantly picking up after him. Anyone that comes over knows my side of the room versus his side. We are childless by choice, but sometimes I feel like I have a house full of them. Help. Thank you. Dana? Yes. Please help us because I am her husband. Right. And I think that's where I come in into this scenario is I always say, just so you know, I'm speaking from the perspective of her husband. I am not, there is not a way to change other people, right? Like it's, it, and nobody likes to be changed, yep. especially in a relationship. You know, I mean, it just, right? Like it often makes you hold on tighter to your stuff when you're like, you're just criticizing or whatever. So, not saying that that's what she's doing at all, but here are the things to remember that we've talked about clutter threshold. Okay. Your mm. husband has a different clutter threshold than you do mm. in common spaces. Declutter down to the lowest common clutter threshold. Now I am not a math person, but I do sort of remember what lowest common denominators were. Right. <laughs> you know? And so it's like, you go, you just, go down more and more and more until you hit that lowest common clutter threshold in shared spaces. That doesn't mean you can't have elaborate systems in your spaces that are like yours to be in charge of, or, you know, we all have different spaces within our home, but in those common spaces, it is likely never going to be satisfactory for you. If you, just create an elaborate system that would work for you and then try to push him into that system. Instead, remember the value of decluttering. If something does not exist in your home, it cannot end up all over the place, mm. right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, along with that, I'm not saying get rid of his stuff so that it can't get out of control. That's not what I'm saying at all, right? But right. when we go back to the container concept, as far as like things that are his, give him a space. Okay. And I don't mean like, this is your space, but I mean, honor the fact that he has things that he's into that are different from yours. You have things that you're into as well and say, okay, I am going to clear out this closet or this shelf or whatever space we have available. I'm going to clear this out and say, Hey, this is for you. This is what I did for my husband who also, I mean, I'm very thankful that he's not super neat because he's, but he's way neater than me, you know? <laughs> so he's always been very, very patient with all of my issues, you know? Uh, but what I did was I, I cleaned out something where I had thought I needed to have a place for, I think it's where I kept my kids out of season clothes. And I said, no, I'm going to clear that out. I'm going to empty it out. And I'm going to say, Hey, this is your space for all of your 1980s memorabilia collectibles that you have, you know, collected over the years because he loves that kind of stuff, but he didn't really do anything with it. And so it was just kind of there and it would just get shifted all around. So I'm like, this is the space for this. Uh, and he was like, oh, oh, wow. Okay. You know, I mean, because I was saying it's not, I'm not going to have this argument over why do you have that stuff like that? The word why will shut people down immediately. Right. 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 So instead say, okay, this is the place that I have created for you. Um, so yeah, put your favorite things in there first and then you know, I mean, whatever doesn't fit, you know, we'll get rid of that, but that worked so well. And it's so funny because, um, my husband has come on my podcast, like whenever I hit a hundred episodes. And so on the hundredth episode is his first time on there. And somebody had asked a question for him and, uh, you know, how does Dana help you declutter? And he was like, well, you know, she gave me, she cleared out this, this thing that, and then she told me, Hey, put your favorite, you know, memorabilia stuff in there first. And then 
I was, and then she was like, whatever doesn't fit, get rid of that. And he was like, and that just made it really easy for me to, you know, determine what I loved and what I didn't love as much. And I said, oh yeah, the container concept. And he was like, what? You know, like you don't have to explain the container concept to them, give them a space and say, Hey, this is your space. And then the key there is to not judge what they put in it. Like let them just put their favorite things in first. And there is no criticism over that. You're going to, I mean, like, and this happens a lot with kids, right? Like is you say, okay, this is put your favorite stuffed animals in here first. And then they don't keep the one that you spent a lot of money on and that, you know, you thought was going to be highly sentimental. And instead they keep the one that the neighbor gave them that they won at six flags and, you know, it's leaking little white, you know, <laughs> pebbles or whatever. I, I mean, like they get to put in their container, whatever, cause you can keep anything, but you can't keep everything. And then you let the container be the bad guy. So it's like, you know, as, so that's as that, so just so I'm clear. So, yeah. so, cause I really relate to this question. And mm -hmm. the reason why I relate to this question is Chris's, clutter threshold is way lower than mine. Yeah. And the truth is he is always picking up after me. My coat is always on the back of the okay. chair. And can I, can I clarify something? Yes. Clutter threshold is the amount of stuff that you can handle. So he can handle. <laughs> It's a possible lot his less. clutter threshold is higher than yours. Oh, that's what I meant. Higher. Yes. Higher. Okay, okay, I okay, meant okay. lower, meaning yes. he's got to have less stuff around. So his clutter threshold yeah. is higher than mine. And if he sees something out of place, he is immediately drawn to go put it in its place. Mm -hmm. And like you, I'm the kind of person that I blow my nose with the Kleenex. I'm on my way to the trash can. Something distracts me. I put yeah. the Kleenex on the counter. Yeah. And we have endless not fights, but it's frustrating for him because he has often said, it makes me feel like you think I'm your maid. And I'm like, no, I just don't care about hanging my coat up right now. Yeah. And I'll get to there's, it later. How do you okay. handle this conflict between so, an organized person and somebody who has a lower threshold? I do want to be clear that I'm not a mental health professional. I always try okay. to make that clear, right? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's not easy. And this is literally the number one question. Okay. But I am going to talk to you as the person asking me this question. All okay. right. Because you are the only person that you can control, right? So we right. can't control him in this situation, but you are asking right. because it does I you know, bad. it's a, it's a frustration in this. Um, what I'll say on that is the five minute pickup is the answer to your tendency to randomly put things down. Okay. What is the five minute pickup? So the five minute pickup is a daily or mostly daily habit routine, whatever you want to call it. That gets the reason I don't call it habits necessarily is that I thought habits were going to be magical. And that if I could just get this down someday, I would be like doing my dishes and picking things up. And I didn't even realize I did my dishes, you know, like that, that's not how it works. I still have to talk myself through it, but it's a, it's a routine. And so it's, I'm going to set the timer for five actual minutes, not okay. trying to trick myself into working for longer, but I'm going to set the timer for five minutes at whatever point in the day where it crosses my mind that, oh, wait, there's stuff all over. I'm going to set the five, the timer for five minutes. I'm going to pick stuff up and put it all the way away for five minutes. And that is the thing that will help me to deal with the Kleenexes that are there, deal with the coat that is here. Those things get put away. So it's like how I combat my natural tendency and keep my house under control. But the other thing that happens is the more often that I do that, the more likely it is, it's never guaranteed. And it depends on how much I have going on in my brain at the time. But the more often I do that, the more likely I am to start to put something down and then realize, oh, every single day I have to come and pick up mm. this thing from this spot. And so oh. I'm much more likely to put it, to put it away. Okay. Got so it. that's my answer to you in this scenario. My answer to him, if he was asking me this question, yes. the first thing I would do is tell a little story about, uh, my husband and, uh, we do this thing where like on our anniversary, we'll kind of like, you know, write in a journal. And, and yeah. in the beginning, it was like all these things we've learned about each other. And it was so easy. And now we're like trying to come up with stuff, you know, it's been 23 years, but, 
Uh, one of the things he said, probably two to three years into this deslobification process, you know, that I was going through is he was like, he goes, I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but I've realized that there, it's like, there actually is something wrong with you. <laughs> and I was so happy that he said that to me mm. because what he was saying was, cause he went on to say, I've realized you don't do this on purpose. Yes. This is not, you are not refusing to close the cabinet doors. Yes. You just literally don't notice whether they're open or closed. You yes. are not putting something down thinking, oh, he will get rid of that later. You don't realize it. And he, and so he, he, he was very nice and sweet about it, but he just said, he said, I've realized this is how your brain works. And I was like, thank you. Exactly. And I'm was, and he realized that as I was working on ways to combat how my brain works naturally. Right. So it wasn't Amazing. just a, every time I say, accept how I am. I am not saying so, oh, well, my house is a disaster. Instead, it's accept how I am so that I can actually do things in a way that work for me so that my house is manageable. It's still not perfect, never going to be color coded, but it's manageable, Amazing. right? Like I can handle it. And uh, so it, anyway, that that's the thing I would say there, but also to realize that it comes down to that clutter threshold. And remember, you're probably not going to help the other person do better in these types of things by organizing. You're going to help mm. them by decluttering. Even some of your own like stuff mm -hmm. in that common area mm -hmm. where we both use this space, it's better for us to have less stuff in here so that there's less stuff to get out of control. So do you recommend that a couple do that together to start in the common space so that you both learn Not the process? Not to start. I recommend okay. that whoever is listening to me, I always say, I'm like, you're the one listening to this lady on the internet who has referred to herself as a slob. I mean, I'm like, you know, you're the one who cares enough to be, you know, listening to this podcast right now or whatever. And so you go ahead and deal with your own stuff. Like don't mm -hmm. start with the other person's stuff. That mm -hmm. is a recipe for disaster. And yet their stuff is more obviously clutter, right? But start with your own stuff first and neutral stuff invisible spaces. And I can't guarantee it except that it happened to me. And it happens to so many people who contact me as you do that. And your family starts to see, oh, okay. You're getting rid of stuff that I never thought you would get rid of, or, oh, it's so much easier to live in our house with less stuff. Then other people start to get on board. Their view of stuff and clutter starts to change. So the, the first thing to do is for you to worry about your own stuff before you try to get anyone else on board. Uh, for anybody listening that's going to go straight to a visible space yeah. and start this process, can you just let them know a little bit about the emotional aspect of trying to let go of stuff and going through the process of decluttering? Yeah. So my five-step process specifically purposefully does not use emotions mm. to declutter, but it's because I was so emotionally attached to my stuff, either because it represented who I thought I was going to be someday or who I had been in the past mm. or, you know, just sentimental things that people had given me that they gave me because they were like, Oh, Dana will treasure this. And I'm like, Oh, do I have to change who I am? So the process doesn't use any of that but it allows for it. Okay. So I am not going to ask you to be heartless. I'm not going to ask you to change how you feel about things, but start with the trash. Okay. Because the beauty of that is as you start with these things and you make visible progress before you've ever even dealt with anything that has emotion attached to it is you see the progress that you're making mm. and you realize Oh, wow. Open space, less stuff changes my house. It changes how this space looks. And then by the time you get to more emotional stuff, it looks different to you, right? Oh, that's or great. you have created the space to be able to keep that item. 
where when we're like, that's going to be emotional. And so I'm not going to do anything because I can't deal with those emotions. Then that stuff just sits there and it's sitting with all this other stuff that isn't emotional. And that makes it, um, you know, never make any progress. And so know that you can make a ton of progress before you ever have to deal with emotional stuff. The other thing too, is this is something you can step away from. So start on those first three steps that have zero emotions. And then if you get to emotional stuff, either skip that item and say, I'm not dealing with that today. I'm going to move to the next thing. Just don't let it stop the process because as you continue to improve your home, you will either create the room for it or you'll be ready to deal with it. Phenomenal. I have three final questions to ask okay. you. You've been sensational, by the way, just Thank sensational. You. Um, you distinguish between routines and to-do lists. Can you explain that? Sure. So I, as a project person, uh, I would look around my house and think, Ooh, I'm changing today. Today's the day. <laughs> this is it. Right. And so I would make a list of all the things I needed to do. Well, just looking at that list of all the things I needed to do was completely exhausting. Right. So the way I actually started to change my home was by just focusing on what I had always thought of as maintenance tasks. And it didn't make sense for me to do maintenance things when my house was a disaster. I was like, no, I need to get my house perfect. Then right. it will make sense to maintain. But instead I was like, well, that's not working. But I do know that other people don't have to spend hours in their kitchen, getting the kitchen clean when it's time to clean the house. And I do. And so I'm going to just, so I started on these very basic things. And so I started with doing the dishes. I was like, I don't know how other people don't seem to have dirty dishes piled on their counter at all times, but they don't. And so I am going to focus on this. And so I started working on the dishes. I started working on, uh, you know, just anyway, just focused in on that and would take about seven days is what I found to be like, okay, now I get it. Now it's starting to feel natural. And then I would move on to another thing. And so I was adding daily habits and that is what changed my house. That plus decluttering, not gotcha. organizing, not decorating, not anything, but daily stuff plus decluttering made, gave me the house that I'd always wanted. So I boiled it down to, um, two very basic habits. Okay. Really there are four that I talk about and how to manage your home without losing your mind. But if you can't do those, you just do these two. And if you can't do both, you just do one. And the first one is do the dishes. So it's right. like, even when I start to feel completely overwhelmed and I'm like, <gasps> do the dishes. Like I hear from people all the time. Like I hear your voice all the time saying, just do the dishes. That gives me something to do to get started. Uh, yep. Then the next thing is the five minute pickup. Okay. Yep. If I will do that, even if my house is a disaster right now, I'm not going to get it perfect first and then start doing five minute pickups. I'm just going to do a five minute pickup every day at the least. Right. right. And then declutter with any time that I have. Great. The What's others, the third routine? Yes. At checking the bathrooms for clutter. Yep. Is another one. I'm not even talking about like cleaning it. I'm not talking about cleaning it. I'm just talking about checking it for clutter. Make sure that, you know, when it's time to clean it, all I have to do is clean it. It's not like covered, you know, like you were talking about your bathroom mm -hmm. counter stuff like that. And then, uh, the other one is sweep the kitchen floor. It's not so much about the crumbs. It's more about an action that helps me see what has been scattered on the floor. Like the groceries where I took the frozen stuff and the refrigerated stuff out. And then I left the other stuff on the floor and it's been there for a couple of days, you know, or whatever. So that type, it's a routine that helps me keep my house under. If I will do those four things, my house looks fine. It's not oh. perfect, but it looks fine if I will do those. And so what I found was I wanted to boil it down so far that I didn't need a list. So I don't have to mm. say, oh, wow, my house is overwhelming. I need to make a new plan. Instead, I just say, my house is overwhelming. I'm going to do the dishes. Doing the dishes significantly improves my home. Wow. Okay. I love this. I love I'm, this because I can do this. This is yes. awesome. Let's just take rule number one. If they wanted to, they would. Now, that kind of stings when you think about other people. When you think about folks in your life that, boy, I wish they'd make an effort. I wish they'd show up. I wish they'd reach out. I wish they'd try a little bit harder. I wish they'd get healthier. I wish they'd, yeah, if they wanted to, they would. But guess what? It also applies to you. There are people in your life 
that wish you would make an effort, that wish you would change some aspect about you. And the truth about all of us is we do the things we feel like doing. And when it matters to you, you do it. And it is hard to accept the fact that if you want to know where somebody stands on an issue, watch their actions. That tells you exactly what they want to do and what they don't want to do. Do not listen to their words because it's easy to say, yes, no, I do this, I'll do that to talk the talk, but talk is cheap. And so it is hard to accept that if they wanted to, they would. And the truth about you is if you wanted to, you would. And so I wanted to kind of like say this swings both ways. Everything that we're going to talk about is true about other people. And it's also true about you. And I like reminding both of us that because it gives you a level of humility and a little bit more compassion when you get into situations with people where they're not doing what you want them to do. That brings me to our first question from Lisa. Hi, Mel. My name is Lisa. And I have a question for you. Mel, I am currently struggling with being a more tolerant person. I struggle with accepting others and their bullshit. We all have bullshit and we all have to carry it, deal with it and unload it. Don't get me wrong. I have worked on myself for years trying to be better and do better. But damn, I want to scream sometimes. Just be better. I have had to deal with so much in life. But I've always wanted more for myself and my family, regardless of the shit that life serves up. Meeting people where they are in life is so important. I know and understand this, but my patience is tried when people wallow. Any advice, Mel? Okay, I love this question, and I'm sure you can relate to it as much as I can relate to it. And before I dig into this... I want to divide Lisa's questions into two different topics, okay? So the first topic is her frustration that people don't want to do better. That's topic number one. Topic number two is how to deal with what's really irritating, which is people who wallow was her word. I say marinate, commiserate, just absolutely at some level love their bullshit. You know those people. Something's always wrong. They're always complaining. The weather's always bad or they're always unhealthy. They're like, like, you know that kind of person. So let's start with the first part of that, which is this frustration that you hear in Lisa's voice. I just want them to do better. I've done better. There's almost like an arrogance and a judgment in that, right? That, oh, well, if I've fixed myself, you should fix yourself. If I can do this, then you should do this. And to me, that's toxic positivity. Just assuming that because you've done it, that somebody else should. And I'm emphasizing the word should, because should holds judgment. If you have the perspective that, if I've done it, then you could do it too. That's inspiration. That's helping somebody. And so what you want to make sure that you're doing is that if you're frustrated, that you're coming from a place of love and coming from a place of wanting to help somebody rather than coming from a place of judgment, of the should, of the you know, you're not doing this, you're not doing that, because we've all been on the receiving end of that, right? Where somebody's beaten you down because they've done something and they think you should do something. I can give you a really good example of this because I think there's a big difference of somebody being capable of doing something and somebody not being capable yet. As, as a person that is new to personal development, and I'm talking about myself, I've only known about personal development for just over 10 years. I am new to therapy. I mean, I've been engaged in therapy for a long time, but I feel like it takes a while to understand that there are certain things that a lot of people have never even thought about or been taught. I mean, I didn't bump into a lot of the topics that I'm talking about right now until I was in my mid-40s. For example, I'll give you one. I didn't truly understand trauma. When I heard the word trauma, I thought that that was something that 
that people that that served in the military had. I thought that you had to be on a tour of duty and see absolutely something horrific or be somewhere where there's extreme violence or be the victim of a really violent crime. I did not realize that there's big T trauma and there's little t trauma. I didn't realize that growing up in a household where you experience emotional abuse or you have parents that are distant or mismatched or maybe you experienced a childhood where there was a lot of poverty or there was discrimination. These are all forms of trauma. I had no idea. And so there are people in your life that would love to change, but they can't right now because they don't even understand that they are trapped in some kind of a trauma pattern. They're not aware of it. There are people in your life that would love to have the level of fitness that you have. I'd love to have the level of discipline that you have, but they're not capable of it right now because they maybe are struggling with depression or maybe they don't have the family structure around them that is supportive that you have, or maybe they didn't have the experiences that you've had in your life that have allowed you to develop the habits that you've had. And so I think it's really important when you start to feel yourself frustrated with other people to check your ego and to ask yourself, well, am I in the lane of wanting someone to better themselves because I care about them and I see potential in them? Or am I in the other side of this, which is I'm being really judgy. That's where my frustration is coming from. And I'm assuming that somebody's got the resources and the ability and the support and the knowledge And all of the, uh, I don't know, like motivation that you need in order to get started. And so I think it's super important, step one, that when you feel that frustration, when you feel yourself getting hooked, that you check yourself at the door. Do I want them to do this because I care about them or am I judging them? And I think that they should do this because I think that what they're, when you get into that lane and you know it, you've got to take a breath. You got to recognize that you're coming from superiority. And I want you to step to the other side because understanding is an act of love. Being compassionate is an act of love. Being tolerant of where somebody is, is an act of love. I'm going to give you an example from my own life. So just this morning, Chris yelled at me. (laughs) That's my husband. And I'm kind of embarrassed to admit what happened to you. Because boy, oh boy, um, I will tell you, if Chris heard Lisa's question, he would say, I'm struggling with being more tolerant of my wife, Mel. And so here's what happened. Our new puppy homie is going to go to a puppy class. And in order to go to this puppy training class on Wednesday, he needs to be up to date on his vaccines, right? No problem. Because when we got our puppy, when he was nine weeks old, I took him to the vet. He got all of his shots at week 12. And that was great. I'm a responsible pet owner. This is fantastic. Then all of a sudden the podcast launched and I've been gone. So Chris looks at me this morning and says, why didn't you tell me that homie is not up to date with his vaccines? I'm like, what are you talking about? I took him when we first got him. He said, Mel, that was when he was 12 weeks old. He's almost 20 weeks old, Mel. He's missed two veterinarian appointments. He is eight weeks late on getting his vaccinations. I, I'm laughing because I feel so bad. And I said, well, I, I, and he, he, he's like, didn't you make follow-up appointments? I said, yes, yes. Where's his folder, you know, that, that, that came with him when we got him as a puppy. I, I, I borrowed a Sharpie from the vet when I was checking out and I wrote the dates in there. And sure enough, we got the folder out and there were the two dates. We have missed both of those appointments. I never put them in the calendar. Chris took the folder. And this is a man who never gets upset. He took that folder, you guys. He slammed it shut. 
He slammed it against his desk. He stood up. He didn't even wheel around on his chair. He stood up. The chair rolled away. And he said, Mel, don't give me this ADHD shit. I know you have a lot going on, but you have a living and breathing animal that you are supposed to be taking care of. This is not acceptable. You have to do better. And there's the dog barking on cue. Apparently he agrees. <laughs> I can't make this up. Everybody hates me right now. Yeah, and you know, and here's the thing, like I'm I know that Chris wanted to scream. Chris did scream at me. Just be better. And I know that I'm now gonna get flooded with comments and emails about this. I'm okay with that. I know I'm going to get a lot of advice about ADHD. I know I'm going to get advice about supplements. Now that you're hearing this story, I'm going to get a lot of you that think I'm a terrible pet owner. I'm cool with that. This is what actually happened this morning. And here's what I had to say to Chris. I want to do better. I don't think I can right now. I am so busy at work. I do not have an assistant I am terrible with the calendars. I'm actually impressed that I wrote the dates down that they gave to me. I thought I put them in the calendar, Chris. But my brain is dropping balls left and right. And so the reason why I'm telling you this story is I'm not letting myself off the hook. I am motivated to try to figure out how to improve the systems that I have and improve the level of support that I have because I don't want to be dropping these balls. Chris doesn't need to get frustrated at me for me to feel like shit about this. Of course I want to do better. But this is one of those instances where my brain doesn't work like his. I can't just, like Chris is Mr. Foundational Operations Guy. Chris methodically sits and organizes and can sit still. He's really good with tech and with Excel spreadsheets. I am the opposite. I am absolutely the opposite. And so the reason why I'm telling you this story is because I guarantee you, you have somebody in your life that, my gosh, you just want to bang your head against the wall. And you can tell yourself if they wanted to, they would. And that's true for some things. It is true. It's true for whether or not people want to show up at an event. It's true for whether or not people reach out to you. It's true for whether or not people make an effort. It's true for whether or not people are engaging in healthy habits. If they wanted to, they would. And then there are some times that it's really important in your life in order to manage your own frustration to be a little bit more empathetic that if they could, they would. And I'll tell you, I am motivated to get the support that I need so that I do not drop balls like this because I want to do better. And having Chris yell at me, it was actually kind of helpful this morning because it, it just allowed him to be frustrated. It allowed me to see that this really is a big deal because he keeps picking up the slack on my behalf. And that's not a great solution either. And so here's kind of where the takeaway is on that. At the end of the day, it's about managing your energy. And when you allow somebody else's consistent behavior, I'm not talking about stuff where people are breaking the laws or they're addicted to something or, you know, something that's super, super destructive. But I've been married to Chris for 26 years and I've been this forgetful. I've been this forgetful and this bad the entire time we have been together. This is not new Mel Robbins. I am definitely overwhelmed with the launch of this podcast and the move to Vermont and all the travel recently and not having an assistant right now. But this is standard. I have wanted to change this my whole life. And I'm trying, man. And a little bit of empathy and support goes a long way. Because if you don't give that to the people in your life, if you're not more tolerant of the things that they're not capable of, they're just going to feel demoralized and ashamed. And so, yes, if they wanted to, they would. And make sure that if it's a situation where they can't really, or it's really hard for them, that you bring a little bit more empathy because that's going to help them. I want you to start practicing right now because these are the two big energy drainers, okay? And you can start today. Energy drainer number one, any time you're complaining. That's right. Complaining to yourself is a complete energy drain, period. We were heading here to the studio. There was a 
ton of traffic. We were running late. I could feel the negative wave of stress coming. I could feel the depleted the depletion coming. I could feel it all happening. I could feel the thought the thoughts starting to go. Mm -mm 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 -mm. That is when you are sucking your own energy dry. I started complaining. Should have got out earlier. Should have done this. Should stop complaining. Stop complaining about that job you don't like. Stop complaining about the traffic. Stop complaining about your partner. Stop complaining about your weight. Stop complaining about the things in your life. Because here's the truth. With a little bit of effort and a little better attitude and a little positive energy, you can freaking change anything because you can take the actions that change anything. And so instead of bitching about the job, get busy tomorrow morning and start looking for a new one. Instead of complaining that you don't have any friends, spend some time putting yourself in activities where you're going to meet new people. This is so important. Anywhere in your life where you are complaining, you are your own energy drain because you are pouring negative energy at something instead of redirecting that same effort and attitude and just ugh, into something positive. So that's rule number one. No complaining. I dare you. Try to go 24 hours and not complain about anything today. It's next to impossible. I would love to hear from you if you take this challenge on. Seriously, I would. Just tag me on social media. Tell me how the 24-hour rule is going of no complaining. Rule number two, stop trying to control other people. Stop it. I was at an event in Las Vegas with my friend, not Las Vegas. I was at an event in Los Angeles with my friend Kathy Heller. And we took a bunch of questions from the audience and this particular question from uh, one woman, I can't stop thinking about. How do you stop controlling your friends? You stop. That's how you do it. When you catch yourself trying to control someone and then you let go of the desire to change them and you redirect all of that angst and energy toward caring, listening, supporting, creating this reciprocal exchange of allowing them to show up exactly as they are, you get connection back. Your attempt to control somebody blocks connection. It blocks the exchange between people. And here's one more thing about letting go when it comes to relationships. Maybe sometimes the purpose that some people play in your life is simply to teach you how to let go. Let's go back to the top of Haystack Mountain in southern Vermont because our friend Mel Robbins, she has huffed and she has puffed and step by step she has made it to the top of Haystack Mountain. And there's something interesting about that. It's an example of how putting in the effort, throwing in the energy and doing things that may be hard, they may be a struggle, they may make you pant and turn bright red in the face. They may make you uh, feel like maybe you can't do this. That's good. That is so good. Because when you push yourself to do something out of your comfort zone, that is positive. And what do you get back? You get back all kinds of positive energy in return. You feel pride. You feel happy. You grow a little bit. You get a great view. And speaking of view, Mel has something that she wants to say to you to wrap this up. The other amazing thing about hiking and uh, being out here in the woods and climbing on top of a mountain is that once you actually get to the top, your whole brain distorts how painful it was to cross the bridge, hike the trail, and go step by step to get where you wanted to go. Um, but it just goes to show you with just a little bit of consistent effort and an optimistic attitude, inch by inch, step by step, you can make anything happen. How do I know if I'm getting used? And what do I do about it if I am? And we're gonna start that process with a question from a listener named Crystal. Hey Mel, it's Crystal and I have a big question. How to know if you're being used? I have two adult siblings that have always lived with me. One has been unemployed for more than three years. Last week, my working sibling was placed on PIP. I've always been the big breadwinner, and they and my mom all lived in my home. My mom passed away four years ago. It's becoming increasingly difficult to motivate them and or get them to understand the weight of responsibility is on me. I'm beginning to think they don't care and are enjoying the stress-free lifestyle they've become accustomed to, 
or they don't understand because they've never had this type of responsibility. I'm growing tired of carrying all the obligation, accountability, and responsibility. When are they going to grow up and be equal contributors or move out? Thanks for any advice. This is really eating up bandwidth in my head. I will add we had a horrendous childhood and largely why we all stayed together. There is safety in numbers and we had to have a united front against a very abusive father and ex-husband. He abused us all well into adulthood. Thanks for any insight. Thanks for all you do. Crystal, thank you for that question and thank you for the detail that you provided in the end. I think that's really relevant to how you handle this and how you think about the situation that you're in, okay? So I've got five takeaways that I'm going to share with you. And the first one is this. There is a big difference between being used by somebody and being in a situation where somebody is used to the situation. Does that make sense? I'm going to unpack this a bit because I think it's really, really important. When you're being used, that's a situation where somebody is intentionally using you or taking advantage of a situation to their benefit. They know they're doing it. For example, um, if you're uh, in a job and you've basically phoned it in and you're only staying there because you want the money, but you're not actually doing what's expected of you, you are using your employer. When you sneak stuff from your roommate's side of the refrigerator, you're using them. When you intentionally do something, like um, invite yourself to somebody's house, even though you don't like them, but they have a great pool and it's a nice weekend, but you are not that great of a guest or you don't really, you know, you gossip about them, you're using them. That situation is very different than what I think you're in, Crystal, which is you're in a situation where the people around you are used to the situation. They've grown accustomed to it. They are comfortable in it. And what's happened is you're now not comfortable with the situation, but they're just used to it. And so I think it's important for you, Crystal, to anchor there. And as you are listening to me unpack all of these takeaways, I want you to apply this to your situation. Are you in a situation where you're being used because somebody's leading you on but deep down, they just want sex. And yet they're telling you that this is more, but they just want sex. That's a situation where you're being used. Or are you in a situation like Crystal where the situation's been like this for a while and everybody's kind of used to it, but you're just sick of it. So you now want to change it. And the details, Crystal, in your particular situation matter because you guys are used to living together. You guys are used to being under the same roof. You said that you've been doing this for a long time. Your mom used to live with you and that there's safety in numbers. And so I believe what's happened is that you are just tired of the situation the way that it is. And that means that you are going to be the one that changes it. Because if everybody else is used to it and they're comfortable in it, they have no motivation or no interest in changing it. Why would they? It's working for them. It's just not working for you. And that's okay. So the second takeaway, you ask the question, when are my siblings going to grow up? When are they going to realize I'm frustrated? When are they going to? Never. They are never going to grow up. Why? Because they're comfortable. They're used to this. They're used to you being in charge. You've always been in charge. You've always been the breadwinner. You said as much. And so they're not going to grow up. And that's okay, everybody. That's okay. That means that you are going to have to be the grown up and you're going to have to parent. And I'm going to get to that. I'm going to tell you exactly what to do when you're in a situation where you're trying to make the people around you level up and help you change the situation. I also want to say, for your sake, Crystal, and for anybody else, that, you know, it sounds like you guys are all so struggling with trauma and PTSD. And so, I know that that's also why you haven't shaken things up. If all three of you 
experienced horrific abuse, which you just said that you did, then you also have the added issue of people maybe not having healed from that trauma and maybe not being as proactive or as motivated or as self-sufficient as they could be. There was another detail in what Crystal said. She said PPI. What does that mean, everybody? It means a performance improvement plan. What that basically means is you're fucking up at work and your bosses have sat you down and they have said your work is not satisfactory and we are going to put you on a PIP, a performance improvement plan, which is very embarrassing. It's very confronting. It, I'm not making excuses for the sibling. I'm just trying to explain the psychology here of why they're not growing up and why they've gotten very comfortable with very low self-motivating standards. And you're now in this framework at work where you're being measured. And if you don't measure up, your ass is fired. A performance uh, improvement plan can be a really good thing because it means that they are providing a pathway for you to be able to excel, which means they believe that you can. But oftentimes when people are set up with a PIP, they feel so ashamed and embarrassed that they just quietly quit. They feel like the writing's on the wall. They feel unmotivated and self-conscious. 90% of people, when they get put on a performance improvement plan, leave the job. Whoa. It kind of makes sense because you feel like you've been called out and you're embarrassed. And so it's really important how you set up a performance improvement plan. Because if it's literally like you suck and you're going to get fired unless you do these things, who wants to stay at that job? But if you set it up using what is called the 19-word magic sentence, this is something that's been studied at like Yale and Stanford, when you say to somebody... I have high expectations of this team, and I think you are capable of achieving them, which is why I'm going to put you on a performance improvement plan so that you know what's expected, and I believe you can achieve this. This is the path forward for success for you. That is a way that makes you want to play the game. And so, Crystal, ironically, we're going to put your family, your siblings, on a performance improvement plan, and we're going to set it up the right way. Because since it's your family, you can talk about your feelings and you can talk about your need to feel support and you can talk about um, these simple things that they can do that would make a huge difference in this living arrangement and in their lives and in your lives. So it can be like a really positive thing that you're going to do. So takeaway so far, you're either being used because it's conscious and intentional Or you're just in a situation where people are used to what's going on and they're not motivated to change it like you are. When will other people grow up and realize this? Never. You got to be the adult in this situation if you want to change it because it's your life. It's your happiness. By the way, it's also your house and it's your responsibility to lead the change that you want to see always. Another takeaway that I want you to have is when you're around people that um, are not motivated to change their lives, you're probably dealing with what psychologists call learned helplessness. Now, learned helplessness was first coined in 1965 by a very famous psychologist after doing these really awful experiments with dogs. I'm not even going to explain the experiments. But basically, what learned helplessness is, is it's when you receive a series of setbacks or you are experiencing a lot of pain and you basically give up. You decide that there's nothing that you can do. It is what it is. And you just survive and try to cope through the pain and the situation. And it's the difference between being a person who is pessimistic, that you feel like nothing's ever going to change, you're never going to be good enough, why even bother, boss never likes my work, or I never do well at work, or my sister already takes care of things, and I'm never going to amount up to anything, versus having an optimistic point of view. And optimism, realistic optimism, is just the belief that through your own actions and through your own attitude, you can make a positive dent in any situation, that your effort is 
always worth it, that trying is always worth it, that growth is available to you. And so I say this because when you're surrounded by people that have this sense that nothing they do matters, it just creates complacency and fear. And there's one thing that makes a difference when you're in this situation. And Crystal, I think that's the situation that you're in. You guys have passed trauma. The situation has always been that you always take care of everything. Now you've got one of your siblings who's on a performance plan, so they're feeling kind of kicked down to the ground. And I would imagine there is this sense of pessimism. There is this sense of I'm just used to life not being easy. And that's where you can come in. And this is the fourth takeaway. You ready? They need goals. They need goals set by you. Goals for how they are supposed to show up. You see, they don't know the path forward. They don't know how it's supposed to look. You do because you want the situation to be different. And so it's on you to set what are called SMART goals. For those of you who have not heard about SMART goals, we will link to the article that was written in 1981 where three researchers came up with the idea of SMART goals in the context of leadership and business. But SMART goals is a very simple and effective way to think about setting goals for yourself or other people. SMART stands for specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. And so here's how this is going to work with your siblings. I want you to think about how the situation could be different. Put on an optimistic hat. And now we're going to paint a picture of what it would look like in the day-to-day living situation so that you feel supported. Because it's not just about the money. Are they doing anything around the house? Are they cooking? Are they caring for the yard? When it snows, do they shovel? Are they taking the trash out on Mondays? Are they making their beds in the morning? Like, what is it that would make you feel as though the dynamic has shifted that everybody's leveled up in their own achievable way and those actions make you feel a shift, okay? And so let's go back to SMART, specific. What are specific goals you could set? And those goals might look like you need to make your bed every morning. Those goals might look like uh, I'm going to make a uh, grocery list and every Tuesday so-and-so is going to go to the grocery store. Uh, I'm going to create a schedule for who's cooking and who's doing dishes. And since you guys aren't contributing financially, that's what you're going to do. I know I'm being very kind of like annoyingly um, detailed here and maybe in a really um, condescending way. I don't mean to be. I'm trying to say that because people don't know what you want, which is what you should assume, and you're the one who wants the situation to be different, you have to get crystal clear, black and white, granular, meaning specific. I got to be able to measure it. It's got to be broken down so that your siblings can achieve it. It's got to be realistic, and it's got to be timely, meaning do it on a Tuesday, do it on a Wednesday, every weekend, I expect this. Because that is how you lay a path forward for somebody who is in a hole to be successful. So the final piece, the fifth takeaway, is this. When you see your siblings doing those actions, when you see them checking the boxes, when you see them making their bed, when you see them spending an hour every day looking for a job, or you see them checking in with you for 10 minutes every night about how work went today. When you see those actions happening, you got to cheer for them. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to create an environment where somebody knows that you believe in them. They know what your expectations are. They know the defined achievable steps that they can take in order to make you happy. And then when they do those things, you got to, you got to cheer for them. You got to say, thank you. You got to say, I appreciate you. And why this is so important is because you're not dealing with a situation, Crystal, where you're getting used. You're in a situation where you're trying to level up. 
your siblings. And you're trying to do it when there's issues like generational trauma and hopelessness and patterns in place and a dynamic between all of you, which means you got to get super intentional about what the new game looks like. You got to define it. And then like an awesome coach always does, you got to cheer for your players as they are in that game. That's how you do this. Um, and I know you can do it because I can just tell based on your voice that you are somebody who is a very matter of fact, professional, successful, awesome person, which is why this is frustrating because we all think that everybody thinks like us. We all think that all those things that you think are obvious, why do you put your stuff on the floor? Why don't you just let the dog out? Why do you leave the dead flowers in the vase on the kit? Don't you just, we think it's obvious. It's not obvious to everybody, but you can make it obvious and you can make it a game worth playing. And don't forget, you get to talk about your feelings. Guys, I love you, but I feel frustrated and I'm starting to feel a little used and I'm starting to feel very sad because I see you guys just coasting in life and I believe that there's something more for you. And so here's my request. If you're going to continue to live with me and I want you to, I need you to show up differently. And here is what I need from you. And I know you can achieve this. It would make a huge difference for me. And if you don't think you can do that, then maybe it's come to the point where we can't live together. But I need this support from you guys. And you might be surprised at how they show up if you frame it in the support that you need from them. It would probably feel really good to know that I could actually do something that my sister would appreciate and feel supported by instead of feeling like the one that's not successful. So here's what we're going to do. You and me, we're bringing the fun. And rule number one, stop focusing on all the logistics. Focus on the laughter. I'm not kidding about this. I want you to weave laughter into the logistics. If you did the work ahead of time to plan for fun and to make sure it's fun, it will be fun. And, you know, when I say don't just focus on the logistics, also focus on the laughter. I want to tell you a quick story. So we're hosting Thanksgiving this year, and my husband, thank God, is handling the logistics. And so he put together an email, and he, you know, assigned all the things out that everybody was doing. And, yeah, bring the dogs and, you know, bring a bathing suit and blah, 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 blah. And um, everybody replies back, excited to see you. And we are. We're so excited to get together. And so now as the emails are starting to fly, I'm starting to feel excited. But everybody's just kind of commenting on the logistics. We'll be there Thursday. We'll be there Wednesday night. We're going to bring the dog. Blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, our son Oakley replies. And he replies in all caps, people, we are going to destroy this feast! Exclamation point. And I just laughed out loud. That could be you. Why not reply to the family logistics text chain with a hilarious gif of somebody dancing with a turkey? Why not put in a hilarious photo of somebody in the family? Why not bring the fun? So don't just focus on the logistics. Make sure you focus on the laughter too. Now, let's talk about step two. How do you stop falling into the, oh, fun will just happen spontaneity category, and you fall into the, I'm going to make this fun thing happen category? Well, let's look at the research. People who are happy do things that make them happy. That's one of those studies where I'm like, yeah, duh. But then you're like, oh, no wonder I'm not happy. I'm not doing anything or prioritizing happiness. They work at things that make them happy. And it makes sense because when you try things that make you happier, you're a happier person. Well, guess what? The exact same research relates to fun. It's seriously so obvious. It's kind of stupid. But let's have some fun with it, right? Let's not be embarrassed. Your life becomes fun when you plan things that are fun to you. Or even with normal things, you just bring a fun attitude like our son did to the email chain. All caps, exclamation, let's go, people. And on that note, I want to share a story with you about the power of bringing the fun, okay? Don't wait for somebody else to do it. Thankfully, um, we have somebody in our family who's incredible at this. Our oldest daughter, Sawyer, who's 23 years old, this woman always brings the fun. I mean, she is always doing something really fun with her friends. 
you know, I can give you a few examples. There was one year where she and her friends were out in Breckenridge, Colorado, and I was looking at the photos online, and they were out at bars in these colonial costumes, literally, like think Holly Hobby, bonnets, prairie dress, apron. They had gone on a bar crawl in costume, in col- like looking like women from a colonial era, like Little House on the Prairie. It was such a riot that that people all over Breckenridge were stopping them. They were featured on the Breckenridge uh, Facebook page. People were taking photos with them. I mean, talk about bringing the fun. That's hilarious. I mean, I'd never think to order costumes and go on a themed bar crawl. Who does that? Well, apparently people who have fun do that. Another thing that she did recently is we had all of her uh, her college friends from Boston College up with their moms for a big mother-daughter weekend. And when we found out that one of the moms who was a widow had just gotten engaged to her boyfriend, Sawyer turned to me and said, let's throw a wedding. I'm like, throw a wedding? She's like, yeah, we're going to throw a wedding. And sure enough, impromptu, they made a sash for the mom. We made a veil out of a paper towel, like, you know, like a long thing of paper towel and flowers out of like, like, I don't like foil And then we blew bubbles and we had her daughter who was wearing this huge foam hat walk her down the aisle in our living room. And then Sawyer went, like, it was hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. Why? She brought the fun. When she heard something, she leaned into it and we just improv. It was just amazing. And she also did this repeatedly during quarantine. So quarantine was actually a really awesome time for our family once we got over the grieving and we settled into the routine of being together because our kids brought the fun. Sawyer went through and made an entire chart for the month of March and she came up with theme nights every other night. There was a family Olympics night. There was a bake-off where we uh, divided up into teams and we had to bake desserts and we also had to dress up as chefs. I mean, it was super fun. But the most fun night was a night that I had never heard of. This is a theme you should steal. I love this. It's an anything but clothes dinner. And what does that mean? I didn't know either. It means you have dinner with your family wearing anything but clothes. You're not supposed to go nude. You are supposed to wear something other than clothes. So Sawyer, for example, took two huge king-size pillows and duct taped them all around her. So she put one in the front, one in the back, and then duct taped it. So that was her clothes or her outfit. Uh, I can't remember what Oakley wore, and I can't remember what Kendall wore, oddly enough. But I took a champagne bottle box, and I put it across my chest. And I, uh, the way that I, I fastened it to me is I poked holes in the top of it and then I put a ribbon around it and hung it like a necklace and then put duct tape on the side so it stayed in place. And then I made a pair of pants out of brown uh, grocery store garbage bags, like one bag per leg, and then taped the front together. Now, Chris, Chris's outfit was something. Um, Chris took a, like a rubber pot lid. So, you know, you have like a metal pot lid. Well, somebody gave us once these like kind of, uh, rubber lids that you can put on top of dishes, like in the summer so that flies can't get them. And it had like a little knob on it. He hung this thing across the front of him in front of his private parts. And that's all he wore except for a pair of clogs and socks. I mean, when he came down the stairs, I almost had a heart attack. He had, on a, he had basically a pot lid across the front of him with a ribbon around his waist and clogs on. I'll tell you, we have laughed about that moment forever. And every time, you know, we get into a fight, Chris threatens to wear that to the rehearsal dinner for one of our kids' weddings. What you're going to learn is that it's not that hard. It only takes one additional person to cause a major shift with you and have the fun be what everybody remembers. That's what we're going to do this holiday season. In fact, this is called the first follower theory. When you're the one person doing something out of the ordinary, people think you're crazy. 
Like think about if you were to go in at the holidays and you're wearing some silly outfit. One of my favorite things to do is to buy themed blazers. You can get them really cheap on Amazon that are just ridiculous. Whether they have turkeys all over them or they have like, you know, holiday decorations or they blink or whatever. Hilarious. If you're the only one wearing one, you might feel like an idiot. When two of you show up, now there's a party. That first follower that joins in with you turns you from you're an idiot to this looks like fun. Same's true about a dance floor, right? The first person that gets up, you're like, ooh, bad dance move. The second one, you're like, mm, maybe I'll go, right? That's how you go from being the lone nut job to being the leader of the fun train, everybody. That's how fun becomes a movement. And so I'm going to take the first follower theory and I'm going to recruit someone to help me. And I want you to do the same. I am going to get our daughter Sawyer on the line because she is the CFO, the chief fun officer of the Robbins family. And so as I get Sawyer on the line, I want you to think of your chief fun officer, the person you're going to drag in to help you. Because if you both are like, come on, guys, everyone will be like, all right. And the fun bus will run the resignation and the cynicism right on over and make sure that fun bus has a damn good uh, music dance party mix too, because that'll also bring the energy up. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we'll be right back because we're going to take a short break. But when we come back, I'm going to introduce you to the CFO, Chief Fun Officer of our family, Miss Sawyer Robbins. Oh, and we're going to talk about how the hell we're going to make our holidays fun. And in the process, we're going to give you some amazing ideas for how you can do the same. Okay. So, Soy, thank you for being here because you know what? You are the funniest person in our family. Not only because you have the best sense of humor and you have the wittiest and driest sense of humor, but you also bring the fun and you make our family so much better because of it and I just love that about you thank you (laughs) I mean literally dude everything I mean the foam hats your idea dinner without clothing your idea a bar crawl in colonial costumes your idea throwing a fake wedding your idea how the heck did you become so fun Um, that is a (laughs) tough question. Um, honestly, I feel like first off, I'm just very outgoing and obnoxious. So I think that that kind of plays a role into it. But I think that I have been fortunate enough to be a part of friend groups where all we want to do is have fun and do things that are out of the ordinary and um I don't know you can always just go to a bar but it's more fun to dress up as like old women to go there (laughs) (laughs) to just go alone that's what I was for Halloween I was a I was a granny can you please describe your costume to everybody because I think it's one of the best costumes I've ever seen um I wore a wig and I got glasses and pearls and I got a cane and I was wearing like a sweater. I don't know. And I, I, I looked on probably 15 YouTube tutorials of how to make your makeup look like old women. And so I had like wrinkles all over me and a big mole. So, yeah. Oh, and you know what other detail I loved? What? You had on like New Balance geriatric sneakers. <laughs> and you, oh, had yeah, a, that. you had a COVID mask hanging from one of those eyeglass things. I mean, the attention to detail. And that's why I wanted to talk to you. Because this is the first year that our family is hosting Thanksgiving at Ground Zero for Thanksgiving, which is the Southern Vermont house. Mm -hmm. And... I feel like there are traditions that used to go with the Southern Vermont house when your grandparents owned the house. And now that we are the owners of the house, and this is the first Thanksgiving that we're inviting the extended family to come, that we should probably get really intentional about mixing up the traditions and inserting a lot more fun. Mm-hmm. That sounds great, honestly. 
<laughs> Why? Do you think that thanks that that holidays are normally not that fun? No, I think they're fun. I I love holidays. Um, if I could, I would just have Christmas all year long. But the fact that Thanksgiving is always a good time in when politics are not talked about or money or people's like life I don't know I feel like all we talk about is the boring stuff and what everyone does for work and then Uncle Tom does his accents and everyone laughs and we have the exact same memories told over and over again and then we go to bed so I don't know I'm 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 down for some more fun this year for sure I agree so can you give me some ideas because you're a way more creative thinker than I am. And I remember when we were quarantining, you came up with a chart of themed evenings that we were going to do as a family in order to mix up the doldrum and to create things to look forward to. Today, you and I are going to have a conversation about the one thing that you need to do this week. Just one thing. And there's a reason why you and I are going to talk about this today, because I know you need to hear this. There is only one thing that you and I are going to be doing this week. And I'm thinking about this right now during the holidays, because right now in my life, it's a vacation week. There are kids home. It's between Christmas and New Year's, and I have downtime. But look, there's always chaos in your life. And I say that because regardless of when you're listening to this, but especially during the holidays... This is a message you need to hear. It's a message I need to hear. It's a message everybody needs to hear because there's only one thing I want you to do this week. Nothing. Do nothing. Wait a minute. Mel Robbins, are you smoking something over there? Did you just say do nothing? Nothing. And here's the funny part about this. I bet you might be doing something right now because you're a multitasker and so am I. You're listening to me while you're doing the dishes, while you're walking the dogs. Heck, you and I might be at the point in our relationship where you are actually sitting on the toilet and I'm in the bathroom stall with you as you're listening to this. Don't tell me that you have not taken me into the bathroom because I can even feel it over here. And I say this because we got to talk about the art of doing nothing. And look, I'm not stupid enough to think that you can actually do nothing. I mean, obviously not. This is like a metaphorical conversation because you probably have to work. I personally love working between the week of Christmas and New Year because nobody's there. So you can kind of like work half a day and you get the full-time pay and it's way more stress-free and you can get more done because you aren't in a million meetings. But if you do have the time off, let me guess, what are you doing with the time off? You're rearranging your cupboards. You're probably trying to learn Spanish. You're doing a million things on your to-do list. You are like just keeping busy. This week, just stop. Please. I want to explain this concept, this metaphor of doing nothing. Being able to do nothing, whether it's just for a minute or it's for a day or it's for a week. This is so important. And I'm having the conversation not only with you, I am talking to myself right now too. I have a hard time doing nothing. Why? Well, because I'm just like you. I'm addicted to being busy. I'm addicted to my to-do list, writing them out, crossing them off, throwing them away, losing them, writing another one especially in the world today, the world has glamorized being productive, being busy, go, 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 hustles, hustle culture, having a side hustle. I mean, there's so much to hustle around. Some days I literally have no idea what I'm doing. You may always be on the go like I am, but are you actually getting anywhere? That's why I want to talk about the importance, the art, the science of learning how to do nothing on purpose. And before we jump into it, I, I don't want you to worry 
because this is not another podcast episode about meditation. That's not what I'm going to jam down your throat right now. And I also want to say something else. Doing nothing sounds like a luxury, doesn't it? Because when somebody tells me, Mel, just do nothing this week. You know what I say? Uh, how about you go F yourself because I got a company to run and I got bills to pay. And I don't know uh, if this is like something that trust funders do or people that don't have to work, but uh, I got kids home. I got stuff to do. And so I want you to know that if you have young kids or you're taking care of aging parents or you're working two, three, four jobs or the night shift, I'm talking to you too because the art of doing nothing is something that we all need in our lives. We have to figure out how to create moments when we're thinking about nothing, when we're doing nothing, because these moments help you refuel. I think one of the reasons why you and I are constantly so stressed and our minds are like a flywheel always going and we're not that present is because we are never not doing something. And so this week, the only thing that I want you and I to do is nothing. And I'm going to break this down, don't worry. Because doing nothing might just mean that you're going to learn this week how to find five minutes to do nothing, to think about nothing. It could mean pushing off your to-do list to next week and committing to doing nothing on it this week. And I need this as much as you do. I mean, when I landed at the airport this week in Albany, Chris picked me up and I had been gone on a business trip for almost a week. And I had also managed to loop in spending some time with our daughter in Los Angeles. And so here I land, I haven't been home in a week, I jump into the front seat of his pickup truck. And I turn to him I'm like, how about we stop at the grocery store on the way home? And he's like, but I've already gone twice this week. And I'm like, well, we probably need something. And then I caught myself and I'm like, what am I doing? Why, why am I filling the time with something? Why can't I just sit in this pickup truck and do nothing? Why can't I just go home and put my bags in the closet and just enjoy time with our son and with our dogs? Like, why do I have to do something? And, and you know, here's another one. So last night, Chris builds a fire and we're sitting there in front of the fire. It's absolutely beautiful. We have a nice quiet evening. We love to play cribbage and backgammon. And so we played around a cribbage and, um, he beat me. I know you're thinking. Normally I beat him, but it was one of those nights where he just had all the hands. I hate that. And so as the game was wrapping up, Chris got up, walked into the bedroom, went to bed. Do you know what I did? I sat and scrolled through my freaking phone. I don't even know why I did it. I, I literally sat there and I started scrolling through Instagram. And next thing you know, 35 minutes have gone by. My husband has gone off to bed. He's sound asleep, snoring, you know, sawing logs. Like he's already like in la la land in his deep dream state. I have wasted 35 minutes getting all jacked up about everybody else's life and what people are doing in their businesses and the stuff that I'm not doing and the things I need to buy and all that kind of stuff. I was so busy. I could have enjoyed myself if I had put the phone down. Instead, I picked it up because I got to be doing something. I got to be thinking thoughts. I got to be doing the thing. I got to be scrolling through the thing. I could have just gone to bed like Chris did. Had a nice, nice sleep. No, no, not me. I got to always be doing something. Here's the irony of the topic today, everybody. I have no idea how to do nothing. <laughs> this is like, this is something I don't know a lot about. And I need more of it in my life. I know you feel the same way, and I want to talk to you about this because of the number of questions that are pouring in from you at melrobbins.com. Questions about busyness, about stress, about burnout, about never having time for yourself, about anxiety, about stress, about feeling like you're last on your list. And so this week, you and I are going to focus on the art of doing nothing. If you are lucky enough to be off of work this week, I want you to stop and think, what would that mean for you? If you are somebody 
who has to work this week. I want you to think, what would a moment of doing nothing look like for you? If you're somebody that has a ton going on, like, you know, you kind of have that feeling like, but I can't, but, 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 well, what, I, but nothing, nothing. What, what if I did not take a breath? What would nothing look like if you could spend an hour doing nothing? Not really thinking about anything, not any agenda, but just doing nothing. What comes to mind for me immediately is running a hot bath. That's what comes to mind to me. Just running a hot bath. I'm not even going to bring a book because I don't want to do anything, you know? That'd be pretty awesome. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed that video, by God, please subscribe because I don't want you to miss a thing. Thank you so much for being here. We've got so much amazing stuff coming. Thank you so much for sending this stuff to your friends and your family. I love you. We create these videos for you. So make sure you subscribe. Mwah.